Welcome back, viewers. You're watching Beyond World is One. This is World DNA, the show that gets you ahead of the rest. I'm Shivan Chandra. And I'm Heem Kaur Saroya. And on the show today, South Korea's Liberal Opposition bloc had secured a landslide win, a major blow to President Yoon Suk Yeol and his Conservative Party. We will get you all the updates from the poll results on the show today. Meanwhile, in West Asia, Hamas says that it has not been able to trace 40 hostages as per the criteria for the first phase of the ceasefire deal. This has raised concerns that more hostages may be dead than initially estimated. We will be getting you the report on that as well right here on World DNA. Let's get you started with the headlines. South Korea's Liberal Opposition Party is set to win elections held on Wednesday, dealing a resounding blow to President Yoon suk yeol and his Conservative Party, but likely falling short of a supermajority. US and Japan announced new military deals aimed at countering China, Tokyo and Washington Inc. 70 pacts on a defense cooperation during Japanese Prime Minister's White House state visit. Joe Biden vows that US commitment to defend Israel against Ira Iran is ironclad as concerns rise of a possible Iranian strike in retaliation of the bombing of an Iranian consular building in Damascus. Hamas admits it is currently unable to identify 40 living Israeli hostages needed for the first phase of a ceasefire deal, raising fears that more hostages may be dead than are publicly known. In an interview to Newsweek, Prime Minister Narendra Modi says India-China need to urgently address the prolonged situation on the border to put behind the abnormality in bilateral ties. U.S. inflation comes at 0.4% for the third consecutive month in March and higher than 0.3% predicted widely. The March price pressures data is more than double the rate needed to bring inflation down to the Federal Reserve's 2% target. Barcelona used their super subs to take control of the Champions League quarter-final tie. The Spanish Giants rally to beat host PSG 3-2 in the first leg. India's Prime Minister extends wishes as Eid celebrations begin in India, marking the end of Ramadan, a month of fasting and reflection. Voting has concluded in South Korea's parliamentary elections. In a major blow to President Yoon suk yeol South Korea's Liberal Opposition Bloc is expected to strengthen its majority in the country's parliament. Right. Nearly all votes have been counted. Over 29 million people, that's about 67% of the eligible voters, cast their ballots. And according to reports, the Democratic Party and its smaller ally are on track to win a landslide victory in the elections. The opposition are set to win over 170 of 300 seats in the National Assembly. On the other hand, the ruling People Power Party is projected to win just over 100 seats. And this means that Yoon suk yeol would avoid the supermajority of a two-third opposition control that could break presidential vetoes and pass constitutional amendments. We tried our best to do politics that uphold the will of the people. But the results of the exit polls are disappointing. However, we will wait till the very end for the final results of the vote counting while watching the people's choice. Now, the bitterly fought race is seen by some analysts as a referendum on President Yoon suk yeol who has three years left in office. The parliamentary election comes at a time when Yoon's popularity is suffered amid the ongoing doctor's strike, rising food prices and allegations of corruption. Thank you. 
All right, for more on this, we're now being joined by Voice of America correspondent Bill Gallo from Seoul. Thank you so much for joining us on World DNA, Bill. Reports suggest that South Korea's liberal opposition parties, of course, they scored a landslide victory in the parliamentary election. Where do you see things, where do things stand at the moment? Do they have the numbers for a super majority? It doesn't seem like it now. Uh, yes, it seems as if the president has avoided a worst case scenario here. Uh, you actually mentioned that in the lead up to this report. That would have been a two thirds majority. With that two thirds majority, basically everything would have been possible. It would have thrown South Korean politics into disarray. They would have had the ability to veto, uh, to, to override any of Yoon's veto. They would have had the ability to impeach mm -hmm. the president. They would have had the ability to even start the process to enact constitutional changes. It does not seem that we will get to that point here yet. However, as you mentioned, this is a serious blow to President Yoon suk yeol It effectively means that for his entire five years in office, he will deal with a very large and powerful opposition force that has many more seats than does his conservative political party. Thank you so much, Bill. In fact, Shivan and I we were just discussing that amongst ourselves and trying to clarify that. Thanks for clarifying that to begin with. Bill, uh, now, what do you think are the factors that led to such a shift from the conservatives towards uh, the Democrats? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, politics here are, are complicated in that uh, it always focuses on very hyper-local issues. You mentioned the doctor strike, which mm -hmm. has played a role. It's gone on for many weeks, and people are very tired of it. So that could have contributed. Of course, there are long-term issues that are not only Yoon's problem, but this is sort of an incumbent effect, right? I mean, high food prices, high housing prices, whoever's in office is going to experience the brunt of that. And in fact, the previous president actually did receive uh, some presidential losses uh, as a result, some election losses as a result of those factors. However, you know, a lot of this is just partisanship in South Korea. Many, many people here just sort of settle into, I'm conservative, I'm liberal, and therefore I will vote for this side or the other. There was a lot of fierce fighting and personal insults in this election. Uh, Yoon himself was embroiled in many uh, sort of, I would say, like low-level corruption and political scandals, and uh, perhaps you could call them gaffes. He never really was able to recover from that, it seems, and now he'll spend the rest of his three years perhaps something like a lame duck president. All right, thanks for summing that up for us, uh, Bill. That was uh, Voice of America correspondent Bill Gallo joining us from Seoul. Thank you. All right, let's shift our focus now. Joe Biden and Fumio Kishida unveiled plans for military cooperation and projects ranging from missiles to moon landings. Well, the United States and Japan are strengthening their alliance with an eye on countering China and Russia. A joint news conference at the White House reflected the growing importance of Japan on the world stage and to the United States. Now, the two leaders weighed in on Gaza and Israel, Ukraine and Russia, North Korea and other world flashpoints. The United States and its allies, including Japan, have been bolstering their militaries to counter what they see as a growing threat from China in the South China Sea and East China Sea. They're going all out to deter any attempt to seize Taiwan, a self-ruled island that Beijing considers its own. Kishida said that the two leaders discussed tense relations between Taiwan and China. Now, he pledged to uphold international order based on the rule of law. Chinese leader Xi Jinping recently said outside interference could not stop the island's family reunion with mainland China. Biden also vowed to keep open the lines of communication with China and said the United States-Japan alliance was defensive in nature. He spoke to Chinese President Xi Jinping last week. In our alliance we have with Japan is a purely defensive in nature. It's a defensive alliance, and the things we discuss today improve our cooperation and are, and are purely about defense and readiness. It's not aimed at any one nation or a threat to the region, and it, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with conflict. 
The announcements from Biden and Kishida brought the old World War II enemies into the closest collaboration they have had since they became allies decades ago. Biden said their militaries will cooperate with a joint command structure and they will, together with Australia, develop a new air missile defense network. The two leaders also announced that Japanese astronauts will participate in NASA moon missions. And overall, the US and Japan have hammered out about 70 agreements on defense cooperation. The pacts included moves to upgrade the US military command structure in Japan to make it better able to work with Japanese forces in a crisis. Japan, often described as Washington's most important Asia ally and its largest source of foreign direct investment, is taking on a stepped up global role. A series of security law changes in the past decade that have transformed its pacifist constitution. Now for more on this, our correspondent Susan Tehrani elucidates on the significance of this upgrade in the US-Japan alliance in the Indo-Pacific. Let's listen to this. Well, both sides hope that this upgraded alliance is a significant step towards countering China's aggressive actions in the region. It demonstrates the commitment of both nations to strengthen not only their defense and security cooperation, but also economic and technological ties. This, both sides also hope, will help maintain peace and stability in the region and uh, promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. Does this all sound very optimistic? Perhaps. We'll have to wait and see. Susan further elaborates on the importance of Japan's role in U.S. strategy to counter China in the Indo-Pacific and the South China Sea. Listen to this. The United States believes that Japan is a crucial ally in the Indo-Pacific region and its role in the strategy to counter China is vital. Japan's military and economic capabilities make it an important partner. But more importantly, Japan's historical and cultural ties in the region make it a key player in promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific. Rahm Emanuel, the U.S. ambassador to Japan, called the meeting between the two leaders a chance for the two nations to go beyond America's work to protect Japan and to quote-unquote write the first chapter in the next era as they work together to project power throughout the region. That would be a more far-reaching relationship than the United States has had historically with Japan, which for decades after World War II restricted its spending on defense and its engagement around the world as well. Now, it's not just the Japanese Prime Minister who is currently in the U.S. to bolster security in the Indo-Pacific. Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has landed in Washington as well. Right, and this is to take part in the summit. The Philippines envoy to the United States has described the nation's attendance in this trilateral summit as monumentous and historic. Ahead of his arrival in Washington, the Filipino president made a stunning claim, questioning a deal apparently signed between his predecessor, Rodrigo Duterte, and China. Marco said he was horrified to learn about a secret agreement with Be that with Beijing that compromises the sovereign rights of the Philippines. The deal apparently bars Manila from shipping construction materials to a military outpost in a disputed shoal in the South China Sea. A World War II era ship has been serving as the Philippines outpost in the Second Thomas Shoal for about a quarter of a century. And Marco says his government isn't aware of any record of the agreement and that they were not briefed about it when he came into office in 2022. Now, under Marcos, the Philippines has deepened military ties with both the United States and Japan. Amid escalating maritime run-ins with China in South China Sea, Beijing has warned that the Biden administration, the Biden administration against interference in the region. Marcos will hold talks with U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. The three leaders will sign an agreement on the South China Sea issues. At the end of the summit, all three leaders are expected to issue a joint vision statement on a shared vision for cooperation between the nations, namely in the Indo-Pacific. Marcos Jr. is also expected to meet with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at the Pentagon before his return flight to Manila on the 12th of April. Marcos has agreed to nearly double the number of Philippines bases that American soldiers can access under the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. Talks are also underway with Japan for a reciprocal access agreement to allow the presence of Japanese forces on Filipino soil. Manila is also expected to court close to 100 in investments from 
Tokyo and Washington, primarily in the semiconductor and modular nuclear manufacturing sector. Marcos Jr. is also scheduled to meet investors from big tech, including high-ranking executives from Alphabet. All right, moving on now. Canada has leveled allegations against China for allegedly interfering with its 2019 as well as 2021 elections. Well, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau reiterated the allegation that China tried to meddle in the last two Canadian elections. Trudeau, who was addressing an official probe, said that despite the attempts, the results of the elections were not impacted and it was improbable. He also asserted that the elections were free and fair. The Trudeau-led Liberal Party, it won both the Canadian elections held in 2019 and 2021. The Canadian Prime Minister set up the commission last year after being under pressure from opposition legislators who were unhappy about media reports on China's possible role in the elections. The testimony made by Prime Minister comes after reports that the spy agency Canadian Security Intelligence Service told the Prime Minister's office about the interference last year in February. According to the testimony in an official probe, the Canadian Intelligence Agency found that China did interfere in Canada's last two elections. Now, according to reports, China clandestinely and deceptively interfered in both 2019 and 2021 general elections. The interference was pragmatic in nature and focused primarily in supporting those who were viewed to be either pro-PRC or neutral on issues relating to the Chinese government. The allegations of Chinese interference come after India was given a clean shit by an official investigation into foreign meddling in Canadian elections. According to a panel of Canadian bureaucrats, there was no interference by India, including funding campaigns of spreading inf misinformation on during the 2021 Canada elections. The panel stated that it found no evidence of any efforts by India to influence the national polls. Now, three sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh were killed in an Israeli airstrike in the Gaza Strip on Wednesday. Well, the Israeli military confirmed carrying out the attack, describing the three sons as operatives in the Hamas armed wing. Now, reports suggest that Hamas has stated it lacks the ability to locate 40 hostages needed for a ceasefire deal. Now, this assertion has raised fears that more hostages might be dead than previously believed. In the seventh month of the war, Hamas wants an end to Israeli operations, withdrawal from the enclave and permission for displaced Palestinians to return home. Hamas said the three sons of Ismail Haniyeh, Hazem, Amir and Mohammed were killed when the car they were driving in was bombed. Haniyeh, based abroad in Qatar, has been the tough-talking face of Hamas international diplomacy as war with Israel has raged on in Gaza. His family home was destroyed in an Israeli airstrike back in November last year, relatives said the three sons and four grandchildren were making family visits during the first day of the Muslim Eid al-Fitr holiday in Shati, their home refugee camp in Gaza City. Israel will open a new land crossing into the Gaza Strip, designed mainly to facilitate deliveries to Palestinians of aid from overseas or neighboring Jordan. A spiraling humanitarian crisis has drawn pressure on Israel from its Western and Arab partners to do more to facilitate the entry of aid. Israel has gradually reopened two established cargo crossings. It's created a new crossing on its border. Last week, Tel Aviv announced it would admit Gaza-bound aid shipments at its southern port of Ashdod. Defense Minister Galan said a new crossing point would be created on the northern part of the Gaza border and it would reduce the time taken to truck in aid from Ashdod 40 kilometers away. And he had said the crossing point would be between the Israeli village of Zikim and Palestinian village of Al of As Saifa. Pardon me. Israel has also helped set up a maritime corridor for direct deliveries of aid by sea and has opened its airspace to foreign pla uh, planes that have parachuted in aid for Palestinians. There has been disagreement between Israeli and UN counts for the aid reaching Gaza. Most people are homeless. Parts of Gaza face famine. Civilian infrastructure is devastated and disease is widespread. Now, countries in the region and the US have been on high alert. They are preparing for a possible attack by Iran in response to a suspected bombing by Israeli planes. 
of the Iranian consulate in Syria on the 1st of April. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said on Wednesday that Israel must be punished and it shall be for attacking the Iranian embassy compound in Damascus. In an apparent response to Khamenei, Foreign Minister of Israel Katz said Tel Aviv will respond if Iran attacks Israel from its own soil. The U.S. president promised ironclad support for Israel. Biden's promise comes despite his public criticism. Netanyahu over the toll on a civilians in Israel's campaign, especially after a strike killed seven aid workers. As I told Prime Minister Netanyahu, our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. Let me say it again, ironclad. We're going to do all we can to protect Israel's security. In a historic vote, the European Parliament has passed a series of a migration laws on Wednesday. The revamped legislation was approved after a deadlock of eight years. Now, this signals a sweeping change in how countries under the bloc now process migration. The European Parliament has just voted in favour of a new way forward on asylum and migration. We have listened. We have acted and we have delivered on one of the main concerns of people across Europe. This is a historic day uh, for Europe. I want to thank members of the European Parliament who have spent years working on this. The 27-member bloc voted on several issues related to migration, including cutting down the length of time for security and asylum procedures and also increasing the return of migrants in order to reduce unwanted immigration from countries in West Asia and Africa. The critical vote comes less than two months before European elections in June. Now, the voting process saw interruptions by protesters in public galleries as they called on lawmakers to vote against the law. Amongst lawmakers as well, there was criticism on both sides of the spectrum. Conservative and far-right parties criticized the legislation for not going far enough to stop migration in Europe. While on the other hand, leftists and rights activists have lashed out at the migration laws as a major blow to human rights. We are against this migration pact because nothing will be improved and things will be worsened. Human rights will be restricted people will be brought into even more danger. It is not encouraging any way. It shows that democratic parties are increasingly adopting positions from the extreme right. It shows that votes and short-term populism are more important or are more important to the parties than human rights and human lives. And we are very clearly standing against this. We want to stop it because you do not stop the extreme right by adopting their positions. Poland has said that the country will not accept the overall migration mechanism. Prime Minister Donald Tusk said on Wednesday they would not accept an EU immigrant relocation scheme and will protect the country against the relocation mechanism. All right, as always, time now for a short break. Don't go anywhere. This is World DNA. When we come back, we bring you more updates on coming in from India. Of course, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has addressed the border dispute with China. He says Beijing and New Delhi should urgently address the prolonged situation on the border and should put behind the abnormality in bilateral interactions. Also on the other side, the Wallace Collection Museum has unveiled its highly anticipated exhibition. It features the line of Punjab, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, this and a lot more after the short break.
Economic turmoil and global unrest have cast a shadow over President Joe Biden's approval ratings. The rockets are continuing to be fired by Hamas in Gaza, although at a slower rate than previously. So, right now, we are with the volunteers from the Aleppo municipality. They are still trying to go to the rescue for the people they can find out. India has emerged as a major diplomatic force at the world stage. The rising cost of living in Nigeria continues to impact citizens from all walks of life. The citizens of Gujarat witnessed a mega roadshow here in the city of Ahmedabad. China is South Africa's largest trading partner for 134 years straight. A domestic aircraft carrying 72 people on board uh, crashed in Pokhara city in central Nepal. 165 injuries have been moved. 61 people are confirmed dead and rescue operations continue around me. After receiving an entire season's rainfall in a span of 48 hours, Chennai city has literally been brought to its knees. Well, that's it. Uh, for we on, world is one. From the bustling trading floors of Wall Street to the vibrant exchanges of Asian stock markets, Weon breaks it down for you to make sense of what's happening as we reveal the key factors behind events, strategic battles, and the game-changing business decisions that shape the world. We bring you all of this and more on World Business Watch. Everyone loves a contest. But sport isn't just about victory and defeat. When the goats in sport speak, you hear it first on Weon. You have to play good cricket over a period of time. I actually pushed myself right out of the damn tournament. We go beyond the stats. Our stories are quoted the world over. At Weon, sport is part of our DNA. Come. Join us on this journey, weekday 6.30 p.m. IST, 1 p.m. GMT. We own India's global voice, the channel that brings you the biggest stories from across the world through India's lens. Now available in more than 190 countries worldwide, because we believe that the world is one. Watch us in Africa, Europe, USA and Canada, South America, Asia Pacific, Middle East and North African regions. Also available on these digital platforms across the world. We on. World is one. The biggest democratic exercise on the planet ever. Decoding the multiple colors of this multi-dimensional, multi-layered spectacle. We on deciphers the images and the hues sifts real performance from rhetoric and noise claims and counterclaims populist pitches and hidden truths untangling unraveling this celebration of democracy Welcome back to World DNA. Thank you so much for staying with us. So far, of course, on the show, we've covered what's happening in South Korea, where the Liberal Opposition Bloc it has secured a landslide win. We'll be getting you all the other big stories from across the globe on this side of World DNA. Let's start by looking at the headlines first.
South Korea's Liberal Opposition parties are set to win elections held on Wednesday, dealing a resounding blow to President Yoon suk yeol and his Conservative Party, but likely falling just short of a supermajority. The United States and Japan announced new military deals aimed at countering China. Tokyo and Washington inked 70 packs on defense cooperation during Chinese Prime Minister's White House state visit. Joe Biden vows that U.S. commitment to defend Israel against Iran is ironclad as concerns rise of a possible Iranian strike in retaliation for the bombing of an Iranian consular building in Damascus. Hamas admits it is currently unable to identify 40 living Israeli hostages needed for the first phase of a ceasefire deal, raising fears that more hostages may be dead than are publicly known. In an interview to Newsweek, Prime Minister Modi says India-China needs to urgently address the prolonged situation on the border to put behind the abnormality in bilateral ties. U.S. inflation comes at 0.4% for the third consecutive month in March and higher than the 0.3% predicted widely. The March price pressures data is more than double the rate needed to bring inflation down to the Federal Reserve's 2% target. Barcelona used their super subs to take control of the Champions League quarter-final tie. The Spanish Giants rally to beat host PSG 3-2 in the first leg. India's Prime Minister extends wishes as Eid celebrations begin in India, marking the end of Ramadan, a month of fasting and spiritual reflection. All right, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has addressed the border dispute with China. Well, he says Beijing and New Delhi should urgently address the prolonged situation on the border and should put behind the abnormality in bilateral interactions. Now, this was in an interview with the United States publication Newsweek magazine. The Prime Minister says the relationship with China is important and significant. The border, border ties between the two countries nosedived following the clashes in Galwan Valley in June 2020. Since then, the two sides have engaged in multiple rounds of diplomatic and high-level military talks to resolve the standoff. When asked about the economic competition with China, Prime Minister Modi highlighted India's economic reforms and claimed that the country is an attractive choice for businesses who are looking to diversify their supply chains away from China. General elections are just around the corner in India. The country with a population of 1.4 billion will start voting on the 19th of April with Prime Minister Modi seeking a rare third term in office. Relations with China, that's been termed crucial by critics. Next up, let's take a look at the developments coming in from the world of technology, starting with Russia, which has rejected an appeal made by Google against a $50 million fine. The fine was imposed on Google in December 2023 for its refusal to delete YouTube content related to the Ukraine war. According to the Moscow City Court, Google refused to remove content that allegedly spread false information about Russia's special military operation, or as Russia would like to call it, their special military operation in Ukraine. Not just that, Google also refused the removal of extremist and LGBTQ plus content from its video sharing platform. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the country has been in constant disagreement with foreign tech companies about content, censorship, data and local representation. However, unlike platforms like X, Facebook and Instagram, YouTube has not been banned by Russia.
ByteDance, the parent company of the popular social media app TikTok, is all set to take on Instagram by launching a photo sharing app. Some TikTok users have been getting pop up notifications on the app. The notification mentions a new TikTok app wherein users will be able to share their pictures similar to Instagram. And according to reports, the app will be called TikTok Notes. Reports further suggest that once launched, the company will automatically push new TikTok photo posts to the Notes app. In other words, users will have to manually disable the cross platform sharing feature on the app. As of now, it's not clear when the app will launch. However, it could prove to be a serious competitor to Instagram. Chinese video game giant NetEase has announced that popular games like World of Warcraft and Diablo are set to return to China. Last year, NetEase and game developer Activision Blizzard ended their 14-year partnership over intellectual property control disagreements. The fallout between the two companies sparked an outcry among Chinese gamers who complained that they would lose access to their favorite games. However, tensions between the gaming companies eased when Microsoft bought Activision Blizzard for $69 billion last year in October, making it the gaming industry's biggest ever deal. Other Blizzard titles like Hearth like Hearthstone, Warcraft, Overwatch, Diablo and StarCraft are also set to make a comeback in the world's largest online gaming market of China. According to reports, OpenAI and Meta are set to unveil their respective AI models that will push the boundaries of reasoning in AI. The corresponding AI systems from OpenAI and Meta are making major progress in thinking and planning capabilities. These upgraded models will move beyond pattern-based answers, usually noted in AI chatbot responses, to actually solving problems and mapping out solutions step by step. Meta envisions its AI agent Llama 3 will be able to plan entire travel itineraries, including booking flights, hotels and transportation. On the OpenAI side, their upcoming release, possibly named GPT-5, will make meaningful strides on the challenges of thinking in AI models as well. Well, moving on to news now from the world of business, U.S. inflation came at 0.4% for the third consecutive month in March and higher than the 0.3% that was predicted widely. The March price pressures data is more than double the rate needed to bring inflation down to the Federal Reserve's 2% target. Now, expectations for a Fed interest rate cut in June have now collapsed. U.S. price pressures remain too hot for comfort for a data-dependent central bank. That means the higher for longer rates narrative is taking hold again. So just like last Friday's jobs report, this is another significant upside surprise that quashes expectations of a June Fed rate cut. As the Fed rides the so-called last mile towards its inflation goal, investors' concern is that the recent price pressures may not be just a blip or a bump in the road. Given the rise in inflation, although marginal at this point, traders have completely written off a June cut. July is also doubtful. Then that means September is the more probable start point of any easing. As such, this will limit the Fed to a maximum of probably two rate cuts this year and not the three predicted widely and by the central bank itself. Barring a rapid reversal of fortunes for the economy, the latest expectations seem more solid. Global trade is expected to see a modest rebound in 2024 after experiencing a decline in 2023 for only the third time in 30 years. Now that's exactly what the World Trade Organization predicts. This upward trend is attributed to easing inflationary pressure. However, the WTO has also revised its initial 2024 growth forecast downwards to 2.6% from 3.3%, citing potential risks. Now these risks include geopolitical tensions and rising protections. We expect a gradual recovery in world merchandise trade volume in 2024 and 2025 after a contraction in 2023 that was driven mostly by the lingering effects of high energy prices and inflation in advanced economies, particularly in Europe. Specifically, we expect merchandise trade to grow by 2.6% in 2024 
and 3.3% in 2025, after falling by 1.2% in 2023. However, the presence of numerous downside risks has added to the uncertainty that is inherent in all economic forecasts and especially trade forecasts. These include regional conflicts, geopolitical tensions, and economic policy uncertainty. In value terms, merchandise trade fell 5% in 2023 to 24.01 trillion US dollars, but the decline was mostly offset by a 9% increase in commercial services trade, which reached around 7.54 trillion US dollars. The decline in global trade volume last year can be partly attributed to weak import demand in Europe. Despite the projected rebound, the WTO acknowledgments. The WTO acknowledges a range of potential outcomes for 2024, with growth estimates varying from a decline of 1.6% to an increase of 5.8%. All right, next up, let's take a look at what's making news in the world of sports, starting with five-time champions Barcelona, who came from behind to beat Paris Saint-Germain 3-2 in the first leg of their Champions League.